to four. Organization. To four. Organization. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You are listening to the most informational packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging projects. Visit powerplanter.com. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us on the program and talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you're listening to us on one of the 16 radio stations that we are broadcasting on through uh, in 2020, our radio app, through our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, underneath the Season 4 radio tab at the top of the page, the in-studio video, or the podcast replay. Thank you very much for taking time and allowing us to be part of your world. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is all about you, for you to help your garden grow better and have healthier trees, a better garden, maintain your landscape, make your grass look greener and everything in between, as well as preserving what you grow. There are several ways in which you can contact us uh, during the show and after the show. And anytime you have a question, you can certainly send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. And we have heard from several of you, and we appreciate the questions that have come in. If you are on Twitter, you can send us a tweet. TWVG Show is our Twitter handle at TWVG Show. Or you can just pound TWVG, hashtag TWVG, and we will tweet you back. You can give us a call anytime, 24 7 during the show, after the show, anytime. You can jam your fingers in the phone and give us a ringy ding ding. Our 1 800 number is 1 800 927 SHOW, 1 800 927 SHOW. O-W. You can leave a message if we can't get you on the program, and we will give you a call back to help you with your gardening problems, situations, your canning situations, your landscape trees, whatever you may have. Uh, we want to welcome new stations coming on board this week. KMET, 1490 AM out of Banning, California. We want to welcome you guys to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show returning on KMET, 1490. From uh, Last year was our first season there, and we're back again this year. We've got a big show lined up for you as we do each program. We're going to talk about what was the Victory Garden and may it come back again here in 2020 in segment one. In segment two, we are going to talk about uh, growing okra. It can be done anywhere and we'll tell you how that can be accomplished. And our guest from Southern California, author and YouTuber Callie Kim will be with us. And we'll answer your garden questions. So let's get into the main topic or the first topic of the program here, the Victory Garden. What was it and may it return here in 2020 due to circumstances? Sure. So the Victory Garden was also called War Garden or Food Gardens for Defense, Food Gardens for Victory, were fruit, vegetables, and herb plots that were at private residences and public parks in the United States. United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and Germany during World War II and World War I. Uh, many people grew the Victory Gardens because they were low on supplies. Um, and and also food. it was to keep supply available, so to supplement, to, to mm -hmm. add to the supply. And, and people may think the Victory Garden was just a World War II, World War II event, but it actually started in World War I. Yeah, because people were getting rations of food such as like coffee, meat, canned goods, sugar, sugar butter, cl clothing, flour, shoes. Clothing yep. yeah. and shoes. And so this was so that they could stretch that essentially. They grew gardens so that they would have fresh vegetables and fruits and whatnot in addition to their ration. Um, it also is, it was it was good for boosting morale, mm -hmm. you know, during a wartime, during um, uncertainty. uncertainty, you're like, I can grow this garden and it's very healthy and it's good for my mental health to be outside. It's good for just me to be outside. Um, 
move around, go and play in the dirt. The dirt has, or the soil has some really positive things. It's been proven. Look up, look up the term farm effect, the and farm and effect. and uh, explains the scientific purposes or scientific uh, behind that. And this was encouraged by the government. And 20 million people, uh, 20 million Americans, we'll talk about the Americans because that's where we are here, uh, answered the call to that. And it, and many people, and we've talked about this on the program and through our videos, you do not have to have 40 acres behind your house in order to have a successful garden. A 4 by 8 square, 32 square foot raised bed can produce quite a bit of produce. Now, Obviously, the more you grow, the more you can preserve. Yeah, that that's mathematics. That just the numbers work in that realm. But just because you only have a couple of four by four raised beds or plots in the backyard, doesn't mean that you're. It's not worth the effort to go about trying to garden or grow something. Right, for sure. And that's the thing is that you could have a huge garden, but you build your soil, control the weeds, control the pests. If you have deer or rabbit or whatever, eating your vegetables is a huge garden going to help you. Not necessarily. If you grow efficiently and effectively, you could grow on a smaller plot. Yeah, and and you can do that very successfully in, in a variety of different gardening methods and techniques. Uh, when the Victory Garden came to be, it made a tremendous difference, as we talked about, on the uh, reduction of the necessary... Um, requirements or produce that was coming out of the shops and the supermarkets across the country and the world uh, in these wartime years. Yeah, so in 1942, roughly 15 million families planted Victory Gardens, and by 1944, an estimated of 20 million Victory Gardens produced roughly 8 million tons of food, which was equivalent equivalent or of more than 40% of all, for all fruits and vegetables consumed in the United States. So 40% of what people were eating was being grown by just the people. And we are victim or we are guilty of the food waste as everybody else is, but it does I would assume and I have no uh, no way of figuring this out or knowing this, but I would assume out of that 8 million tons of food or the 40% uh, there was minimal amount of waste compared to what we are accustomed to and are seeing on a regular basis in the 21st century, in the 2020s now, uh, the amount of food waste because a farmer doesn't have the prof, 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 uh, profitability or the profitability of it. They dump it and have the insurance pay the difference because it's not worth sending it to the store in order to make dime on every dollar type of situation. Right. Um, yeah, so even, like, the president, the first lady in 1943 had a victory garden at the White House. Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt mm -hmm. uh, planted the victory garden uh, on, and it wasn't really, it wasn't encouraged to do such, but she felt it was necessary in order to lead the country by example. Uh, she And then it looks like President Wilson during World War I, um, he would graze sheep on the South Lawn to help prevent um, having to have it mowed. Yeah, and so there's definitely like different components of agriculture there. A different time in American politics to a certain degree there, uh, yeah. where you have sheep on the, the White House lawn, so you don't <laughs> have to have the uh, lawn crew maintain it and mow it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so there, there definitely is some um, patriotism in a victory garden and taking care of your family. So I would definitely encourage something like that if we go through uncertain times. And there there have been many uh, different organizations that have popped up or been created across the country that involve the term Victory Garden or uh, Garden for Victory of that type of titling in order to encourage the reintroduction of backyard gardening. And we see it very... Uh, uh, very prevalent on social media pages that uh, there's a lot of Facebook groups that are new gardeners or organic new gardeners, uh, and they ask very uh, what some people may say is uneducated or educational questions, but they don't know. And, yeah, and definitely not. And and Holly and I are the same way. I grew up on a farm. Uh, we 
did things very differently in some aspects. Holly grew up in the city, but yet we have made some very common mistakes Mm -hmm. that now we look back on and go, well, that was silly, but we made that mistake, and now we're able to help others not make the mistake and be successful the first time around instead of the third or fourth time because we've made those mistakes as well. And that's just it. You, if you've never gardened before, you don't have much experience gardening, you're going to make mistakes. We still make mistakes. It's a journey. You're not going to be perfect at it the first year. There's definitely stuff for newbies, for novice gardeners, available information. We're definitely help, happy to answer questions. But it's something that is a learning process. And definitely do your research. Um, just because we live in this growing zone and you live in another growing zone, are we going to grow things at the same time? Not necessarily. The technique is the same. You have to. Um, you may have to alter the dates and times in which you apply that information in order to have the successful crop in which you're trying to grow. Um, so what we can do is uh, in, in 2020, uh, we are going through situations and we want to look at the... Uh, availability of what we have on our properties, whether it's indoor, porch container, patio container, or anything in between in which we can grow a successful garden, plant plants, and uh, lessen the impact in which we have from purchasing products at the shops and the grocery stores. I think another thing we can recommend, too, is if you're going to grow a garden for the first time, maybe your neighbor's growing a garden for the first time, and your friends or whatever with your neighbor, you should communicate with them. Maybe you can grow, they can grow one thing. Maybe maybe they have a better sunnier area that you can grow in, and they want, they could grow the, the stuff that fruits, like the tomatoes, peppers, beans, what have you, and maybe you have the shadier area, you can grow the greens. Well, uh, and also, you know, containers, people would may shy away from that, container aspect because oh i can't grow a lot you can grow a lot in a grow bag in a container and buckets and and pots on the patio porch deck there's elevated raised beds if you can't grow in the garden or on in the ground or you don't want to construct raised beds um and what we want to look at is you know where we're at now uh the shops and the stores have uh not 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 very much product but then there the, the supply chain is there but where the supply chain may break apart is two or three months down the road um, in these shops. And, and that's, you know, a, a problem in which we may see where, yeah, things are good now, but the, there's going to be a, a time in which we won't have the product for a while or the quality of the product is going to be diminished greatly because the harvesting it early or unripened in order to get it to the stores uh, to get it sold And we may see that as well uh, two or three months down the road uh, because of the situation that we're in. Now, for some people in areas in which farmer markets will be allowed or uh, are allowed, you want to support them. You want to go to your local farmer's market because on average, uh, a farmer who sells at a farmer's market, and these are just kind of general pricing here, can make they'll make about 90 cents per dollar if you they sell it at a farmers market but they're only going to make about 20 cents on the dollar if they sell it to a a garden or of a grocery store or a shop so support them in the local farmers market and and do that if you can do it at all I would definitely recommend um, using farmers markets as well and just keeping in mind that if you grow this food grow grow what you know you're gonna eat grow what you know that you can grow, like here, obviously we're in Wisconsin, we cannot grow banana plants, but maybe you and people who are in Florida or the South can grow banana plants. So definitely keep that in mind um, about about where you are. And also keep in mind about storing things properly. There's a lot of vegetables that you can store for a long time. And so that's something to keep in mind as well. And when I was talking about the two or three months down the road, that's called supply chain shock, where everything's good now, supply chain is there, but there's a deficiency at a certain point where the quality is not there or the product may not be there until it can be grown and harvested accordingly uh, to to the uh, requirements in which the uh, buyer uh, the grocery store is requiring. So, Victory Gardens, uh, World War One, World War Two, 
Uh, I, I think we're going to see somewhat. Where I'm seeing more people who have never gardened before talking about, I want to grow something here in 2020 uh, because of the, the situation in which we're in. But also, I think there's, there's the curiosity of, hey, I can do something to help. And by growing a garden, I can lessen the impact in which I have on the on the the supply chain. Oh, for sure. So we want to thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show. Now this is our fifth show of 2020. Uh, did you miss last week's show? We'll talk about whether we talked about whether or not you should tell your garden and four great fruit trees and non fruit trees for your property. We also talked with author Kim Ironman. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. Or we can make it even easier to find them. You just send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Put whatever uh, whatever show, so last week was show four, in the subject line, or you could put all, and we would send you the link. We'll be right back. Do not go anywhere. We'll be talking about okra. You are listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program to help you grow better, garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. <music> Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens understand that healthy soil is always the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the micro life needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jim's will stimulate life in the soil and supply all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% bioavailable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. Chicken Soup for the Soil is an amazing fertilizer that will increase the quality of all the fruits and vegetables you grow. Perfect for gardeners, growers, and farmers. To find out more about Chicken Soup for the Soil and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Make watering easy. Dripworks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975 and today continues to provide those seeds to gardeners just like you. With 600 plus varieties offered in this year's catalog and 18,000 listings on their exchange, their gardener to gardener seed swap, Seed Savers Exchange is keeping cherished seed varieties alive. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. World's CoolestRainGauge.com. Need I say more? Tree Ripe Citrus Company has top quality produce that comes right to your neighborhood with the freshest peaches and blueberries you'll find. To find locations, go to tree-ripe.com. Do not settle for the rest when you can have the best peaches and blueberries with Tree Ripe Citrus Company. Go to tree-ripe.com. Responsible watering. Accurate, fast, and efficient. Earth conscious. Visit waterhoop.com. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, 
Happy Leaf LED, Dripworks, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Hanging around to talk about okra. Thank you very much. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is the website in which you can find all contents uh, of everything that we do. Videos, uh, radio shows, digital magazines, and more. Well, Holly, let's talk about okra. Now, just totally disclaimer here. You are not a fan of okra of any type of consistency whatsoever. No, I don't like the okra. No. Do you even like the flower that the okra comes from? Like, what do you mean? The, the hibiscus flower, like, it, it's related to the hibiscus. Do you like the flower, even? It's pretty. Okay. But I'm allergic to, I think it's hibiscus, or maybe it's hydrangeas. Well, okay, well. I'm not really sure. Well, what you, should, those? you shouldn't eat those anyway. Well, the, the scent. Yeah, okay. The scent. Well, let's talk about okra. Now, okra, people, many people associate okra with, well, it can only be grown in the south. Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, North the Carolinas, you know, hot, dry climate. That, that's simply not the case. Uh, okra can be planted in most parts of the country, uh, not just the south. It can be grown in the north. We've got several videos on our website that illustrates that. Uh, now, there is about 135 different varieties of okra worldwide. Not all of them are readily commercially available. Uh, they're predominantly green potted. And there are some burgundy pod. And we grow the Clemson spineless okra. I do like the seeds of the okra. They're very unique seeds. Very, they uh, look like tiny little marbles. Well, BBs. BBs. Oh, yeah, yeah, they look yeah. like BBs. But they're green. I'm sure the red ones are probably more red. Yeah, and when they dry, they turn to a, a brown consistency. Now, you can. it's not recommended, per se, by the book to start okra indoors. However, you can go to your independent garden center and pick okra up. Uh, so most of the time, they are planted in deep welled uh, containers because that they have a very deep, a very um, strong, thick tap root. That's why you're, it's not recommended to grow them in containers that are very shallow. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we talk about a tap root, we have extracted old plants out of the garden that has had a tap root of 19 inches. Uh, they can get a tap root at full maturity of up to 24 inches and beyond. So you can but just to be clear. Yes, if you don't know. Okras are okra is growing above the okra themselves grow above ground. Right, and yeah. it's, it's that not a root crop. right. It's that tap root that can you can you can damage like, the plant. Yeah, it looks like it could be a, a root crop though because it's when it when it's grown in full capacity, it has like kind of a, a tapered end, and to me it looks kind of like. It could be grown as a root crop, but it's not. It's grown above the fruit is on the, the branch. Yes. Now, you can start your okra seeds indoors about three to four weeks before your last average frost date. Uh, you want to do it in a very deep uh, weld container, uh, a very high party cup or some type of grow bag in which it has plenty of root space uh, to get it established and then harden it off and take it outside. They, in order to get the germination uh, to any seed, you can soak them in water, compost tea, uh, to hydrate the seed. However, with okra, it's very, it has a very dense coating on it. So what you'd want to do is soak it in milk overnight. That lactic acid in the milk helps eat away the seed coat and allows it to uh, grow or to, to pierce through and, and, and grow, germinate quicker. Uh, you want to plant your okra about one and a, about a half to an inch deep, uh, 12 to 18 inches apart of rows, and the plants uh, being about a foot to, to a foot and a half apart in, in each individually. Now, in the south, they can grow up to be like giant palm trees. In the north, uh, you're, we get them about four and a half, four, four to five foot tall. And 
uh, you want you oh yeah you want the the plants to be twelve to eighteen inches apart and your your rows to be about three to four foot apart so you have plenty of access to get in and they have plenty of room to grow so again twelve to eighteen inches apart in the row and the row spacing from one row to another three to four foot uh, now whenever we plant our okra. We plant, I plant it three, every three inches, three, six, nine, 12 inches. Then I can cut out the plants that I don't want because I can always overplant and then remove the plants I don't want rather than if I do plant one, 12, 24, 36 inches and I got one that didn't come up, it's hard to get another seed to ch- catch up to the ones that have already germinated. So overplant and then you can always wean out the ones that you don't want. You want to do full sun. Uh, absolutely the hottest p- place on your property. You- I think I think that's probably the most, no matter where you are, you want to have that full sun because it's going to provide that heat. Yeah, they can tolerate some drought conditions, but you want the hottest spot in your, your garden and uh, or, or your property. If you've got a, a hot corner, plant them there and you can get full sun. Uh, got good soil, put them in that area. And okra will take about 55 to 60 days for the plant to begin producing. And they'll produce, the plant can produce for 10 to 12 weeks. Um, it can bear the pods until frost. However, you, the more pods the plant will produce will greatly is greatly determined on how rapidly you harvest the pods that it's producing. If you allow the plant to put on five or six pods and you don't harvest them, that plant is not going to produce anything else because its job is to reproduction of seeds for the next generation. It doesn't care that it's you're eating the pod. So small pods, two to three inches long. If you get larger pods um, at the end of the season, you can save those for the seed. There are some gardeners who have found those larger pods, if not harvested, they do become woody. But if they you, you can them, you pickle them, it seems to be that there are some uh, availability, uh, some edible consumption uh, ca- capabilities there after you've pickled them. It kind of softens them up a little bit. You could... Um we dehydrated some. Yep, you can dehydrate them. Uh, we'll talk about here what some of the things in which you can do with the okra. You can eat it raw. Yeah, absolutely, you can eat it raw. Uh, there are some places in the world where they actually take the uh, pot, the seeds, the mature seeds, and make coffee out of them. Uh, they're... Uh, Okra is known in some parts of the world as lady fingers. Uh, there, a little trivia there. But you can eat them raw. You can pan fry them. You can cut them up and pan fry them with a little salt and butter. You put them in soups and stool, stews. You can dehydrate them. Uh, you can deep fry them, which I think anything deep fried is probably pretty good. Uh, the, if anything, the South has taught us that uh, deep fried stuff is really good. And you can also just grill them. And it all depends on the size of the pod in which you are harvesting. Uh, Two to three inches is a very tender pod. They will have these very beautiful flowers on the the plant prior to the pod developing. Uh, And we talked about it earlier. They are related to the hibiscus plant. That's where those flowers are uh, resemblant towards. So uh, okra, it can be grown in the, in the north as well as the south and anywhere in between. You follow the same procedures. You put it in a hot spot. You keep moisture to it, and it will not get as tall, obviously, in the, in the northern portions of the United States. But you can get it to grow, and get it to grow fairly successfully. There are some maintenance uh, requirements to it. But other than that, it's a very easy crop to grow, and one many people do not realize can be added to their repertoire of vegetables to be added uh, that can be grown in their backyard. Especially if it's something that you enjoy. Yes, yeah, you have to enjoy this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so soon it will be warming up, and you want to make sure you can enjoy your yard without sharing it with beetles and grubs. With spring just around the corner, it is time to start thinking about controlling beetles and grubs in your yard and garden. Grub Gone can be applied to turf or garden around ornamentals to control grubs and lessen the impact that the beetles have on your yard this summer. Easy to use, apply with any commercial spreader or irrigated and irrigated into the soil. It's biologically, biologically specifically targets grub and beetle invaders without harming the beneficials such as bees, ladybugs, and butterflies. Does not hurt them. Does mm-hmm. not hurt them, but it focuses the, the attack on the beetles and And it's grubs. the only non-chemical that works. You can find more information by going to phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. 
Do not go anywhere. When we come back, YouTuber and new author Callie Kim will be with us. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow indoors and out. 24-7-365. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your place for all things gardening, canning, radio shows, digital magazines, and more. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. The Simply Solar Greenhouse is a one-piece molded fiberglass greenhouse that is easy to install and maintain. Multiple sizes available. Check them all out at migreenhouse.com. Trimbin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Dreaming of a lush green lawn and abundant garden? Not sure what products you need? Check with Chapin. From sprayers to spreaders to fertilizer injectors and greener gardening options, Chapin offers the products you need to weed and feed your lawn and garden. Feed your plants every time you water with Chapin's HydroFeed Fertilizer Injector. Weed a greener way with Chapin's Horticultural Vinegar Sprayer. Check with Chapin. Visit www.chapinmfg.com. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. ShipDrop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door for free. ShipDrop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ShipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Spartan Mosquito, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Another growing season is just mere weeks away, and the place to go for all the Milwaukeeans to get all the garden supplies that they possibly could need is Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center. Blue Mel's has over 40 varieties of bulk material. They have a knowledgeable staff, as well as they'll cater to your needs. If you don't want to cut grass, they have that service available to you. If you need delivery on your bulk material, they can do that for you. If you need landscaping done, they will help you get that done and get it done the way you want to do it, not the way they want you to have it done. Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center, you can find them just off of Leighton at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. You can give them a call anytime at 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for hanging around. You obviously want to hear from our guest this week. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. 
Kelly Kim is a backyard organic gardener dedicated to help helping you grow your own healthy, delicious vegetables in a quick, simple, and in- inexpensive way that fits into your hectic lifestyle. She lives in Southern California with her husband, Jerry, and their children, and they work as a team to produce garden content that helps people all over the world grow organic vegetables. Welcome to the program, Kim. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day, a very busy schedule, to join Holly and me and all of our listeners across the country to enlighten us and, and provide some of your garden knowledge with all of us. You are welcome. I am thrilled to be here and share how wonderful it is to grow an organic vegetable garden. Well, let's start from the very beginning. You are uh, you're, you're a new author. We'll talk about your book momentarily, but you have a very successful YouTube channel. And how? Wh- where did that come from? Did you have a background in gardening, or, or where did this whole let's start a YouTube channel thing come from? Sure. Well, my husband, Jerry, is actually a videographer on the side, and I love to garden. And he and his friends decided one day they wanted to try and make a viral video. So he asked me, Kim, what are you doing? And I happened to be um, spreading some compost around some herbs in my garden. So he said, "Okay, I'm going to come out and film you. And you just start talking about what you're doing and explaining about composting. So that's exactly what we did. And we uploaded that as our very first video. And people started watching and then asking for more videos. They wanted some videos on seed starting and, you know, growing tomatoes and making your own tomato cages and things like that. So we started um, doing a little bit of research because at that time I was a fairly new gardener. So we started doing some research and then asking people in our videos if they could give us some ideas and tips and tricks. And then we ended up trying those things in future videos. And uh, people really enjoyed that sense of community. And that's basically how our YouTube channel started. Well, we we talked to people every week and, and multiple years behind these microphones, and we asked similar questions, and it's all, all very similar to what you described. It wasn't something that was planned out for years, and here's what we're going to... You just kind of fell into it, or life presented it to you, and it was a very good thing that life gave you. Absolutely, and we love... Jerry loves making videos. I love teaching people, and over time, as our YouTube channel grew, we decided that it was a good combination of skills to really put our efforts into teaching people how to grow vegetables, and it's very rewarding. And much like Holly and I, we can, you get to do that with somebody you love and, and somebody you, know, you can bond with. Absolutely. Now, what is one of the most common questions you get from gardeners of all levels? Well, without a doubt, it's about watering. How do I water my vegetables? How much water do I give my vegetables? When do I water? I think that's the area where most gardeners get tripped up and are really um, confused about. So, um, you know, I wish there was a magic answer to that question. But as you well know, Joey and Holly, it's so dependent on so many different factors, the temperature, how much rain you get, this type of soil you use, the type of vegetable you're growing. So I like to give some really basic principles and fact, I dedicated a whole chapter to it in my book. But basically, the quick and simple is you really need to check your garden daily. If you have a moisture meter, that's always handy, but you don't have to. You can use your finger as a moisture meter. And depending on the type of rain that you've gotten or haven't gotten, just put your finger down into the soil, check to see if it's wet. And if it's um, dry, you need to water. If it's wet, you don't need to water. And over time, it's kind of a trial and error process. You kind of learn what your garden needs based on the weather and the type of soil that you have. And I'm sure you're just like Holly and me. We've all killed many, many plants thinking we were doing the right thing, whether not watering or watering too much. And we've learned over the years what what ha- what works best for certain plants. Absolutely. We tend to overlove our plants, which I think all gardeners do. And then you do, you learn over time that you can back up with certain plants and then certain plants need water. And it, and before you know it, you're watering like a pro and uh, you're just learning as you go. And if you kill a few plants in the process and it's no big deal. Definitely. Um, now you have a lot of DIY home cleaning recipes or ideas. Um, what is one of your favorites and why? One of my favorites is an all-purpose cleaner, and I feel like that's really important these days that we want to keep our surfaces and countertops really clean. It's super easy to make. It's basically just equal parts of rubbing alcohol and water and a couple of tablespoons of vinegar. Super easy, super basic. You save a ton of money, and it gets your surfaces. You can even use it for your windows and your mirrors. It gets everything super clean, as long as you can find rubbing alcohol, which seems to be in short supply these days, too. (laughs) 
Uh, always something that, to keep the, the house clean, not only for yourself, but for your family and for your pets. Absolutely. And it doesn't use any harsh chemicals. So um, it's good, good all the way around. Now you're in Southern California. We're in the North here in Wisconsin. We've got people listening all over the country and the world. What are, what we all deal with pests in some form or fashion in the garden. What are some ways in which you have found to protect your plants from common pests? Well, I think the biggest thing is really make sure that you have really good, healthy soil. And um, that's the, the first place I like to start with anything in my garden. And I use a lot of compost in my soil to really, you know, help the microbial activity. And I love to use worm castings, too, which, as you well know, that's, um, you know, nature's best fertilizer. And it really does help bring in the, you know, the beneficial bacteria and microbes. And then one really simple way that I like to, um, if I do notice pests, on my plants um, is just spray them, give them a good spray with water, knock those pests off, and really just keep an eye on things. Again, checking your garden daily. Maintenance is always the best um, cure. I mean, prevention is always the best cure. So try and prevent a problem before it even starts so it doesn't get too out of hand. Proactive instead of reactive. The problem seems to be less uh, intense uh, if you can follow that procedure. Absolutely. Now, we all, we all have a plant that we can't grow. Holly and I can't grow uh, broccoli or cauliflower for nothing. Uh, is there a plant that you struggle with that either you're continuing to try to grow or you've just said, hey, this is just something we can't grow in my backyard and I'm moving on? <laughs> Yeah, I hear you on that one. I struggle with broccoli and cauliflower, too, because of the heat that we have here, even in the wintertime. Uh, but I still do try every year. But one thing I've pretty much um, given up on is spinach. Um, we also have a really hard time growing spinach because of our fluctuating temperatures. Um, the wintertime is the best time for us to grow a cool weather vegetable like spinach, but it takes longer to germinate. Um, I just tend to get really impatient with it. And then once it finally does start to grow, we'll get a, a couple days hot spell, it'll bolt. So for me, I like to really put my resources on things that are going to be easy for me to grow. We all have limited resources, limited time, and spinach is one of those things that I've just pretty much said, I'm just not going to grow it anymore. I, I have other things I love to grow more and have kind of just crossed that one off my list for now. That definitely makes sense. Now, um, you have a new book. It's called Organic Gardening for Everyone. What is the book about and is there a favorite tip in that book? Sure. Yeah, um, I wrote the book um, just because I wanted people to feel like anyone can grow a garden. Um, it's not something that's rocket science with a few little skills, a few quick, simple, inexpensive tips. You can get out there, plant a vegetable garden, and it's even more important now in what the world is going through. So it really just um, takes people by the hand walks them through very simple step-by-step -step instructions of how to grow a garden from start to finish, including starting from seeds indoors, um, getting your uh, plants um, acclimated, and then getting them transplanted out in the garden, including watering, setting up garden beds, installing drip irrigation if you sh so choose to. But one thing I really like to, I really emphasize in the book and like to tell new gardeners is start simple and then expand later. That's really my garden motto. So start very simple with one or two vegetables. The easiest one to grow is lettuce. Start with a little container, grow yourself some lettuce, get yourself a few skills, you can get some confidence, and then you'll be hooked once you taste that first harvest. As you know, homegrown vegetables are so amazing in their flavor. And then you'll want to grow more and expand your garden into other vegetables. Well, you bring up a good point. Start with one or two vegetables. And, and what we were talking about in the first segment is some people, some gardeners are like, well, if I can't grow a big garden, it's not worth doing. You and uh, you can do not have acreages in your backyard. You've got a, a moderately, I would say, average to small backyard. But you're able to pack a lot of stuff in that garden and you're able to do it very successfully. Absolutely. And even if you don't have a yard and a lot of people are growing on a deck or a patio or a balcony in an apartment, there is a lot that you can pack into a small space. We dedicated a whole garden series to um, small space gardening and just grab yourself a couple five gallon containers, a couple of little, you know, fabric raised beds. I use a lot of fabric containers and plant yourself some salad vegetables and a couple of tomatoes and things like that. And you, you're a gardener. You've got a garden. Well, Kim, we greatly appreciate you. How can people find your YouTube channel, your website, get a hold of your book? Where can we all go for that? 
Well, my website is calicumgardeninhome.com and I do carry seed collections. You can find my book on there and you can find me on Callie Kim pretty much on all social media, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Well, Callie Kim, we greatly appreciate you taking time not only to share your knowledge with Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. And it's been a great conversation to have with you. Thank you so much for having me, Joey and Holly. Well, thank you very much. Do not go anywhere. When we come back, it's all going to be about your garden questions and our garden answers. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, a program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow indoors and out. You can bet the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala kombucha makes your body smile. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Do you tweet? Send Joey and Holly a tweet to at TWVG show or just use hashtag TWVG and they will tweet you back. Conserve water, save time, reduce runoff, eco-friendly. Visit waterhoop.com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night dries clear and odorless it will not clog your sprayer deer defeat works for 30 days through rain snow and freeze safe effective and works on rabbits money back guarantee to purchase go to deerdefeat.com and use code radio to save 10 percent on your order deer defeat it can't be beat Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. Blue Mel's has been one of Milwaukee's premier garden centers for over 60 years. We have always been committed to putting our customers first. When there is demand, we stock it. When there is an idea, we grow it. When there's an opportunity, we build it. And when there is a need, we deliver. Our family continues to offer you the industry's best garden and landscape products and services. The same as my parents did when they first started the business back in 1955. Visit Blue Mills. Quality and service are the roots of our business. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome 
Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for hanging around. We're going to answer some of your garden questions. If you got a garden question, you can submit it at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, or you can uh, give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Again, email account is gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Holly, what is our first question for the today? Well, somebody wrote in and said I had tomato hornworms last year, and they eradicated my tomatoes. How can I get rid of them or prevent them? Well, tomato hornworms, a terrible thing to have. What you can do what is wherever those tomatoes were planted last year, do not plant them again this year in that same location. Secondly, wherever those tomatoes were planted last year, as soon as you can get in to work the soil, whether it's spade, shovel, garden fork, uh, tiller, whatever you want to use, whatever you do choose to use, uh, go ahead and do that. Disrupt that soil because larvae is laying in those in, in a, a determined depth uh, with us, with that species, and by disturbing it early in the season, you can actually bury it deeper or raise it higher up in the soil level, and at 90% chance it will not survive uh, over the, the hibernation period or the, the larvae stage for it to develop uh, into uh, the, the devastation of what it, what it does. Uh, so that's another way in which you can control it. And also, uh, you can use, uh, if you do have the problem, you can use a, a product. It's an, an organic material. It's called BT, and it's either in liquid or powdered form. However, you have to reapply that every time it rains. Uh, you have to reapply that uh, on your, your tomatoes. But disrupt the soil where it was at last year, and even where you intend to plant the tomatoes this year, go ahead and as soon as you can disrupt that soil in case there are larvae living in the soil in that particular bed or area of your garden to reduce the chances even greater uh, in that uh, tomato hornworm situation because, yeah, they will devastate a crop very quickly. Holly, what is the telltale signs that you do have the tomato hornworm if you're unfamiliar of what it may, what, what the, the, the signs are? Well, most of the time, you know, like a day or two before you're going to harvest that tomato. It's always a day or two before. <laughs> when the tomato is like almost ripe, um, you'll go out to your garden and you'll see like basically a little kid came along and ate around the outside of the, of the tomato. And there's just like a core hanging there. And on that core are black or brown droppings. And that's how you know. Um, sometimes if you don't have tomatoes yet, they'll eat the leaves of the plants as well. So... Either or. They're active during dusk and dawn, and during the hottest portion of the day, they'll tuck up underneath a leaf, and it's very difficult to spot. There are some images online in which have that show that you can take a black light out in the evening, and you can illuminate them, and they will stand out. So that's another way in which you can control them. And what we have found is, one, not planting them in the same spot in which we had them in the years prior. But additionally, bringing in birds into the garden makes a tremendous difference. So wherever you're planting your tomatoes, at the time the planting occurs, or even a little bit before, take uh, just posts, wooden stakes, nail a tuna can on top of it, poke some holes in it so, for drainage, and put bird seed in. And what that does, that, that encourages birds. Birds are very beneficial to the garden. And people are like, I don't want birds in the garden because they're going to do peck holes in my tomatoes. Well, if they're pecking holes, it's because they are looking for moisture. Uh, so incorporate a bird bath if that's the issue. But you're bringing the birds in. They're feeding off that bird seed. And birds have very keen eyesight. They will see these hornworms moving around, and they will pick them off, the, off your tomatoes. Now, we've done all three of these combinations because in 2014, we had planted 60 tomatoes, and we had gotten five pounds of tomatoes off of those 60, pound, those 60 tomato plants during the whole growing season because we were inundated with tomato hornworm. So in combination of all that, moving the plants, tilling the soil, uh, incorporating the bird feeders, we've had like two plants in six years that have been affected by the tomato hornworm. So good luck with that. It will work, uh, especially the bird bird aspect of it. What's our next question, Holly? Um, Bet Betsy asks, I have grown leeks for years, but lately they are almost all bolting. What is going on? Um, yeah, why is this happening? Well, this is done or occurs, even though leeks can handle cold temperatures, it's the fluctuation of uh, the, the cold and warm temperatures. It's a very common, uh, the most common answer to the question is leeks planted when it's cool 
and then we do then it gets warm early in the season and then it gets cool again and then it turns to summer so that very harsh rapid fluctuation in temperature can cause these plants to go into like oh it's my second year of growing because it was really cold then it was really warm now it's really cold again and now it's warm again these are biannuals onions and, and leeks are biannual plants and they will produce a seed pod so that can be the best uh, most common situation so if you have had situations of this in the past it's not going to hurt to wait a few extra weeks to plant the leeks if you are capable of holding on to those leeks in your grow room or waiting and buying them later on in the garden uh, at the independent garden center uh, what i would suggest is as the days get warmer uh, you can set them on a windowsill in the house and then uh, it, past the time and with years past that this has occurred harden them off, and then go ahead and plant them. So that would be one way in which to uh, get around that particular situation. Uh, next question here. Uh, Holly, can you plant an indeterminate con uh, tomato in a container with success? If so, what varieties would you recommend? Tomatoes I have grown in the past have been brandy wine, old German, Roma, as well as yellow grape varieties. Thanks for any guidance and suggestions. Well, they're all th those are all good varieties yeah, to grow. Yeah, sure. You can definitely grow them in containers, indeterminate or determinate. You want to um, use like a 10-gallon grow bag or a five gallon bucket with drainage holes. And then if your indeterminate tomatoes get tall, you want to stake them. And you can just take one of those tomato cage deals and put it right into the grow bag. That's not a problem or right into the bucket. But you definitely want to make sure you have enough soil because tomatoes do need all that soil for their roots. And and they, and you said stake them because these, in, explain briefly what a determinant and an indeterminate and a semi-determinant, because there may be people listening that have grown tomatoes for years, but they don't understand what that lingo represents. Sure. So an indeterminate tomato is also known as a vine tomato. So that tomato is going to keep growing and producing even until you until uh, frost or if you just pull it out of the ground or container. Or if you kill it. If you kill it. Um, determinant is a bush tomato. So that means that it's going to put on one, one main fruiting. Once it's done, then it's done and it looks more like a bush. It doesn't grow as much as a vine. And then semi-determinant, or I think they're also called mid-determinant, is kind of like a combination of the both. It's going to vine a little bit. It's going to put on a main fruiting. And then it's going to put on more fruit, but not as much as like a vine tomato. Uh, a good, good indeterminate variety we've always found has been black crim. Uh, has been a, a production a plant for cool, hot, dry, wet, doesn't matter what type of uh, season it is. It has been a phenomenal producing uh, variety. And then any really any of the cherry varieties are, are very prolific. You know, a, a very healthy cherry tomato plant. Uh, of of a of a indeterminate variety can produce 500 plus tomatoes a year if you maintain it, keep it healthy, keep it watered in good soil. That's a lot of cherry tomatoes uh, on one plant. So yeah, you can grow that on your patio porch deck uh, or you know in backyard and get a lot a lot of tomatoes off of a one plant. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Sandra asks, I don't get around to plant. I didn't get around to planting garlic last fall. Can I still plant garlic this spring? If so. How? What is the best variety? Well, uh, you can plant garlic in the spring. However, and there's always a however with this, garlic, we have found, does very well and the best when you plant it in the fall. We plant it the first Saturday in October each year. You want to try to guess about 30 days before your, your first really hard freeze. Uh, and what that does in the fall, that allows that plant, that clove, to develop roots, get established, and then that freeze or that hard, fr uh, that hard freeze kind of sets it in a dormancy state until spring, and then it's able to project upwards and start really growing. Now, we have experimented with growing garlic in the spring. The challenge with this particular method of planting garlic is getting it in the ground as early as you possibly can chisel it in the soil to allow it to have the adequate number of cold hours in order to develop the bulb correctly. You're planting a clove and you're trying to get it to develop into a, uh, a, a, a very nice uh, a bulb of garlic. Uh, we were able to get garlic. However, it was about 80% reduction in size compared to the fall garlic in which we planted. So there are some challenges. 
Obviously, it's going to grow better in the ground. My grandpa has always said, we grew up on a farm, the seed is going to grow a lot better in the ground than in bags in the shed. So you want to at least get it in the ground. And even if you have a small harvest, you can get the... Uh, get something off of it. Now, here in the spring, it's going to be quite a challenge in order to find garlic available somewhere in order to purchase, because majority, if not all the garlic you see online, is sold in the fall months. We would recommend a Spanish Roja, a German Hardy, a Georgia Crystal, uh, uh, some, some, something in that realm uh, has done very, very well for us uh, in the garden. All right, Holly, next question is, can I direct sow leeks and fennel in the garden, or do I need to uh, start them indoors and then transplant them? Well, so leeks don't necessarily do well from direct sowing because they take 150 days to grow. So we definitely start ours um, indoors. You can, I don't know, can you buy leek starts? Yes, you can. Yeah, Yeah, just like the onion starts. uh, Go for your independent garden center, and they're usually, in our with ours, at Blue Mills, they are in the six packs, uh, and you get, or you get a little four foot container of them. There's hundreds in there, mm-hmm. and they do phenomenal. Um, fennel can be grown straight from seed. You want, you could soak the seeds for 24 hours beforehand. Um, you want to plant the seed when the soil is about 50 to 70 degrees. So yeah, you can do that. Uh, fennel has a very what 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 kind of uh, it has a very unique. Uh, it tastes kind of like licorice. There you go. That's mm-hmm. what it is. You'd also plant. Uh, basil that tastes like licorice too so if you're into licorice uh those are two different two different uh, varieties there you can uh do not not for me no but, um, no. yeah definitely so so, so uh, okra uh, uh anything that tastes like licorice. licorice uh you don't like okra you don't like okay all right N- next question there's stuff you don't like either. i know i yeah. know all right what's so the next Sandra question wants to know about growing celery celery okay. um she's been growing it for the past two years part of her quest to grow all of her sauce ingredients she starts from celery from indoors in two different locations her own backyard doesn't get more than five hours of direct sun the celery does okay but tends to be skinny and more herby tasting is there anything she can do to improve the flavor and size well celery needs calcium for best growth so you want to mix some bone meal or gypsum into your soil bone meal is a good all-purpose amendment to add to your garden uh this is this can uh, in the ground and it will add the soil and uh, the plants will pick that up and have better growth. It also may be a, the variety in which you're growing. Uh, also is the case uh, of the taste too. There's several different varieties, multiple varieties of celery in which you can grow in your garden. So it may be the variety in which you're currently growing that you're not getting the flavor or the taste that you're, you're thinking you should get. Uh, size will also be improve by adding the nutrients to the soil and you could try it and um uh you know try it in a grow bag uh root maker grow bag uh, you can use coupon code twvg show at checkout and save 10 percent. they got one gallon to 60 gallon and raised beds that you can purchase uh by doing that you have almost complete control over the whole situation the grow bag you're adding good enriched compost or potting soil or raised bed mix of whatever the case is and then you can determine and start narrowing down factors and what's causing the situation for that that celery issue so good question our next question is what is the difference between f1 and heirloom and organic and hybrid seeds uh we talked about that in show one um Organic is and F1 is a hybrid variety. It's it's a cross. It's the first generation. Right. And then organic is plants that are grown by the United States Department of Agricultural. Well, they're not grown by them. They're well, certified. They're, they're certified by so them. You get that they certifi- set a guideline. Right. They set a guideline. You get that certification. Um, so you're growing organically under organic conditions, typically with organic uh, pesticides or what have you. Um, so it's basically like a stamp of your process now and the hybrid and the f1 are similar mm-hmm. in, in characteristics and properties they're, they're not a genetically modification no so hybrid is basically a botanist or horticulturist would take varieties of favorable favorable varieties of plants and then combine those varieties together so like a drought tolerant early producing tomato or a lettuce that is uh, more heat resistant um, as opposed to a regular lettuce. And there's so, nothing wrong with hybrids. No, there's nothing wrong with hybrids at all, especially if you're new to 
gardening hybrids are they take they take the the edge off maybe they do they yeah. do it's kind of like it's kind of like bowling with bumpers right mm-hmm. like takes the edge off hybrid is like gardening with the bumpers up well that will do it we appreciate uh, we are out of time and we certainly appreciate yours miss any portion of this show or want to revisit in its entirety you can do that by going to the website the wisconsin vegetable gardener.com and clicking on the season four tab at the top of the page or you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and say, send me show five, and we will do that. Or any past shows, we can get that to you as well. You can find all of our videos, and in-studio video and podcasts at our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Dot com. Tell a garden friend uh, that this program is on your radio and podcasts are available. This is how we get our message out and how the word spreads about our Garden Talk radio show. Join us next week when we will be talking about seven flowers to improve your landscape and help pollinators, as well as eight heat spinach substitutes. If you can't grow spinach, like Callie Kim said, she gave up on it. We're going to go over eight substitutes that are similar to spinach that you can grow in your garden, as well as author of the Straw Bell Garden book, Joel Karsten will be with us talking about Straw Bell Gardening. Uh, we will also answer as many of your garden questions as possible. So until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs> <laughs>